Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Joanna Hernandez. On the show tonight, Chicago officials are closing four migrant shelters as the number of asylum seekers living in city facilities drop. Chicago Public Schools votes to remove police from public high schools by the fall. Our FY25 budget proposal makes some hard choices. A state lawmaker weighs in on the governor's budget proposal. Eviction is just one small step close to being homeless. Exploring the relationship between homelessness and poverty and evictions in a new exhibit. And a local group's effort to diversify figure skating. And now to some of today's top stories. Chicago Public Schools is under federal investigation from the U.S. Department of Education for alleged violations of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The Department's Office of Civil Rights opened the investigation on Tuesday, but would not comment on its nature. The investigation comes in the wake of a student and parent complaints of anti-Semitic comments during a January 30th student walkout protesting in favor of a city council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Israel and Gaza. CPS would not comment specifically on the investigation, but in a statement says, as a system, we recognize that the ongoing conflict in the Middle East has led to an increase in anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim incidents. While CPS actively works to promote student voice and protect students' constitutional free speech rights, bias-based harm is unacceptable and will not be tolerated. The U.S. Education Department says it has ramped up investigations since the October 7th beginning of the Israel-Gaza conflict and is also probing Northwestern University and the University of Illinois Chicago reportedly for alleged anti-Semitic anti-Semitism at Northwestern and alleged anti-Palestine discrimination at UIC. AT&T customers are once again receiving service this evening. That's after a massive outage disrupted phone service for thousands of customers, leaving them unable to place calls, texts, or access the internet. At 2 p.m., the company posted on its website that service had been restored for all affected customers. The reason for the outage remains unclear. You can drink it on the rocks or frozen. You guessed right if you thought of a margarita. It's National Margarita Day. There are debates on where the margarita was invented, but we can all agree it's one of Mexico's most iconic drinks. And there's no doubt in Chicago you can find a bar or a hundred <laughs> that serves the beloved cocktail. Now cheers and go drink one. Up next, city officials are closing four migrant shelters. Heather Sharon is, is up next with more on the story right after this. Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by the support of these donors. Chicago officials closed four migrant shelters in the past two weeks as the number of asylum seekers living in city-run facilities has dropped 17 percent since mid-December. WTTW news reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with a look at the current phase of the humanitarian crisis gripping the city. Heather, you have been on top of this. Tell us which shelters have closed and where they're located. Well, the four shelters that were closed are the Harold Washington Library Center in the Loop, the New Life Community Church in Lakeview, Casa Esperanza in North Lawndale and North Park Village in North Park. So distributed across the city, and the beginning of January, more than 400 people were living in these shelters as the city struggled to cope with a renewed surge of migrants making their way to Chicago from the southern border. And I believe at one point, Harold Washington, it closed and then reopened again, correct? Correct. correct. And how much money will this save? Well, Mayor Brandon Johnson told reporters yesterday these shelters were among the most expensive for the city to run. And by the end of the year, the city will save somewhere in the neighborhood of $19 million because they won't have to lease these facilities staff them and provide food and laundry service for the people living there. Okay, and the city is now caring for about to over 12,000 migrants in 24 shelters across this, across Chicago, down from nearly 15,000 in mid-December. 
what has caused the drop? Well, there are really two causes. One, the number of people seeking asylum after crossing the southern border has dropped, and that's typical for winter months. It's just more difficult to get to the border. Also, city officials say everybody's doing a better job of trying to find more permanent homes for the migrants. That's apartments and homes, and it also includes getting people to elsewhere in the country where they might have relatives or friends. Well, let's talk about costs. The state, city, and county officials pegged the current cost of caring for migrants already in Chicago at an additional 321 million through the end of 2024. Do we know where that money is going to come from? Which is the main question. <laughs> yeah, not yet. We heard Governor J.B. Pritzker this week ask the General Assembly for $182 million. And Cook County Board President Tony Prankwinkle says the county will come up with another $70 million. But so far, Mayor Brandon Johnson has said he's not quite willing to ask the city council for any more money. Keep in mind that the city's budget already has $150 million earmarked to help care for the migrants. This is the main question we'll be focused on in the coming months. Well, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Joanna. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. It's all at WTTW.com slash news. Chicago's Board of Education today passes a resolution directing Chicago public schools to end its use of school resource officers. WTW news reporter Matt Masterson joins us now with more. Now, Matt, this has been an ongoing heated debate among CPS parents, students. For those who are in favor of removing SROS from schools, including Mayor Brandon Johnson, what are they saying? So yeah, this is an issue that's been going on for years, but people who've been advocating for the removal of uh, SROs, they say that police in schools doesn't actually improve safety and instead criminalizes students for issues that could be handled better by existing school staff. They, they say that these officers are only making things worse. The board itself has pointed to an overrepresentation in the number of students of color who um, are suspended, expelled, and they're the subject of police notifications in schools with SROs. So the idea is that investing in more holistic approaches can lead to better safety outcomes for students and also lead to an end of the so-called school to prison pipeline for some of these students as well. And talking about that, how about individuals, individuals on the other side of the debate? Why are they concerned about removing CPS officers from all school campuses? Part of it is a safety issue. Some people definitely believe that having police in schools does keep their students safer, but it's also a bit about local control and this was something that came up a lot today during the board meeting. Um, the board in 2020 began allowing local school councils to vote on whether or not they wanted to keep or remove their SROs. So now that ability is being taken away, the board is deciding unilaterally that there will be no SROs at any high schools in the city. So members of the school communities who did see this as a value of having police in schools, they voted to keep them in place. They did this already and now they sort of feel like the rug is being pulled out from under them and they don't have a say in this anymore. And how many uh, CPS schools are currently utilizing CROs and are there any other tools besides CROs that other schools are implementing to provide a safe environment? You did talk about a more holistic approach. Right. There's 57 SROs that are currently in 39 high schools. Um, since the board began allowing schools to decide on this themselves, um, 14 schools have already removed about 28 officers over the last few years. But some of those schools have started reinvesting that money in social workers, uh, counselors, and restorative justice programs to improve other safety aspects of their schools as well. And there's also a financial piece to this equation, right? What has a financial impact been like to those schools that did remove SROs right. from their premises? So the board, the current contract is a 10 point three million dollar one year contract with the Chicago Police Department. That's what's going to be eliminated when this goes away. But the schools that have voted to remove their SROs, they've been given a roughly four million dollars to invest in some of those programs um, for additional staff and programs that uh, focus on restorative justice and other holistic measures. And you talk, can you talk to us a little bit more about the timeline for CPS right. to come up with the new safety plan? So the resolution that the board approved today puts a timeline on this. It, it directs CPS CEO Pedro Martinez to come up with a new school safety plan that does not include SROs by June uh, June 27th of this year. Well, thank you, Matt, for your report. Thanks, Joanna. And we're back with more right after this. Governor 
Governor J.B. Pritzker unveiled his $52 billion budget proposal yesterday. Amid other things, the plan calls for committing $182 million to care for migrants. A move Republicans are pushing back on saying, pushing back saying those dollars should go towards citizens instead. Joining us now with more is State Senator Omar Aquino, a Democrat from Chicago. We also invited a number of Republican lawmakers to join us, but they declined. And Senator, first question, initial thoughts on the budget. Yeah, uh, initial thoughts is that, you know, we, uh, Governor Pritzker on um, yesterday uh, uh, gave us his initial plan of what he would like to see uh, the General Assembly pass uh, come at the end of May. Uh, it's on uh, a continuation of work that, that he and, and we have done for the last five years where we've been putting the Illinois in a better fiscal footing. Uh, we've had five um, balanced budgets that have led to paying a backlog of bills and nine credit rating increases. And so this is sort of the initial part of this conversation that's going to go from now until the end of May. And so uh, there's a, no a number of things to highlight in his proposed um, uh, budget, one of which is the, uh, the establishment of a child tax credit for the first time here in the state of Illinois. We saw how a child tax credit federally uh, during the pandemic lifted, literally lifted um, millions of, of children out of poverty. And so having something like that in the state of Illinois to make sure that working families are getting money back into the pockets is, is, is that's really important right now. And so you would, you would say it's a big with, deal. You know, like, yeah, I, I, I certainly do. Um, and I, I want to go to uh, uh, something that Illinois Republicans said that when they held a news conference responding to the governor's address, here's some of what they had to say. The governor's budget does not reflect the overall priorities of Illinois' families. The budget provides better health care for undocumented immigrants than for most Illinois families. In fact, on Governor Pritzker's watch, the state will have spent more than $2 billion in taxpayer funds on health care benefits for undocumented immigrant adults. Additionally, the state will have spent $820 million to address Chicago's migrant crisis. And Senator, they're concerned with the amount of spending on migrants, the migrant crisis and undocumented people. I want to hear your, your thoughts. Why do you think this should be included in the state's budget? Certainly. So let, let's start with the first note that they they, uh, they talked about, which is the uh, Medicaid like program that we have in our state for undocumented uh, folks. That's something that I'm super proud about. Actually, I led that effort in the Senate uh, and was a proud sponsor of that, working with then State Representative, now uh, Congressman Delia Ramirez. And we were the first state in the nation to offer a Medicaid like program to undocumented folks, specifically starting with seniors. And now we have folks. 42 and above. These are folks that live in our communities. They come, they, they are they may be the themselves undocumented, they live in mixed uh, um, status households. They are our neighbors. They, you know, if anything we learned from the pandemic is that my neighbors' uh, health and their family's health impacts my own. And so we want to make sure that we have a healthy uh, society. And so I think that's a, a, certainly a proud uh, thing that we, we consider. And, you know, it's interesting that uh, that, that uh, uh, Republicans said is that the, the Chicago migrant crisis, it, it is an international humanitarian crisis that we're dealing with. And specifically what we're seeing in the state of Illinois and then mostly in the city of Chicago is a political stunt by Republicans. Uh, Governor Abbott, who is, is literally busting people in uh, in the midst of winter in sandals, in, in shorts with the pregnant women, children. And so there's a responsibility that we have as as, as public servants to make sure that all people are, are protected and cared for. And that's what we intend to do. And so this this proposal uh, commits dollars not only to, to, to health care, but also to provide um, a much needed a wraparound services to all I want, I want to talk about that, about what you just state. mentioned, the health benefits for immigrant adults and health benefits for immigrant seniors uh, programs. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what would these programs do? So it's a Medicaid-like program where uh, now there's folks from that can be as, as young as 42 and above that, uh, that, that have lived in the state of Illinois for some time that are undocumented, that need health care, that would, that would, 
that would be eligible for Medicaid had they been um, uh, you know, a, a, a citizen. Um, we have a basically a lookalike program in the state of Illinois that we dedicate state dollars to make sure that people are able to get um, a, a medical card. What does that do? That means that they can go get preventative health care um, uh, services rather than going into the ER and certainly, uh, which also is a cost to our society in terms of, you know, folks that go to the ER cycle through and whatnot. But these folks now are able to take care of uh, along going uh, uh, issues like diabetes, cancer, and so forth, it is a, a life-saving measure. Would this include DREAMers as well? Because I know they also, they're not unable to receive uh, Medicaid. So there has been a coalition, and I've been a, a champion and an ally of that coalition to try to make sure that we were bridging the gap. As you may know, that with all kids, undocumented uh, children as well, from uh, from birth to, to 18 are able to get, to 17 are able to get uh, uh, healthcare coverage. With our uh, expansion, now 42 and above uh, as well. But there's still that gap between 19 and 42 year olds that uh, you know certainly dreamers uh, uh, don't get this uh, type of uh, uh, coverage here in our state. And we are still working to bridge that gap so that all folks are able to get um, uh, medical care um, if they need uh, so. So we're still working on that. That's something that we haven't been able to accomplish, but it's not something that we've given up hope on. And Senator, this is the last question that I have here. The governor's office estimated an $891 million deficit, and Republicans pointed out that he didn't address how he would fund additional spending. Do you know how this is going to happen? So he, he did note a, a, a few different ways of uh, closing some uh, corporate tax, tax loopholes that are that cost the state uh, hundreds of million dollars a, a year. Uh, I know that, uh, and I have faith, because we've seen it, you know, the the... the the proof is in the pudding, right? Um, we have not, uh, in the state of Illinois, um, balanced the budget on the backs of working families. We have not done that in the last five years, especially with, with Governor Pritzker at the helm. Um, what I believe is gonna happen is that in the next three months, we are gonna come together to get a balanced budget on time that works for working families uh, uh, throughout the entire state of Illinois and making sure that it is a fair and balanced budget that doesn't, um, uh, and that puts money back into folks' uh, pockets and not hurt them. So that's what we're, we're planning on doing. The governor gave us a roadmap with his introduced budget, but we have until now, until May, to accomplish that. Well, thank you, Senator Aquino, for your input. Thank you. Thank you so much. Up next, we take you inside a new exhibit that explores a relationship between homelessness, poverty, and eviction. Stay with us. The recent migrant crisis has shone a light on a problem that already existed in Chicago, homelessness. Several factors can lead to not having a home, but for some it happens after an eviction. A new exhibit works to explain the relationships between eviction, homelessness and poverty with help from those who know it best. It's based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book Evicted by Princeton sociologist Matthew Desmond. As part of WTTW's ongoing initiative Firsthand Homeless, Brandis Freeman takes us on a tour. My name is Rosemary, and I was 14 when I was evicted from my home. It's this video that James Lee Williams says he finds especially moving. It's touching. It's about a person that's really pouring out her heart that she lost everything. The video plays as part of an exhibit called Evicted, based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book by Professor Matthew Desmond. Williams can relate because he's experienced it too. I lost everything, you know, due to the fact that um, I was ran over by a car and and it just went downhill. The position where the job that I had during construction, they said I could no longer work there because I got pins and screws in my leg. My money ran out, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't getting no check. Yeah, I was evicted. William says he's still homeless, couch surfing with friends and family while maintaining a picture perfect exterior. You know, I just played a role with people like, you know, yeah, I still stay here in this house right here. You know what I'm saying? Like that. And all alone, I don't stay there in that house. All alone, I'm staying here. You know what I'm saying? In the summertime, I might sleep in my car some days. You know what I'm saying? In the summertime, I might go to the hotel. The role Williams plays here at the National Public Housing Museum is educator, helping visitors better understand the impact of eviction on those who experience it. 
I didn't pay rent for a couple of months, and then they, they came and got me. They said, I got to go. And uh, most of my stuff got destroyed, you know what I'm saying? Um, I got most of my stuff, but then I started putting all my stuff in the storage. I still got storage, stuff in my storage now. I got stuff at my mom's house. I got stuff at my auntie's house. I got stuff at my cousin's house. I got stuff at a uh, friend's house. You know what I'm saying? Stuff is everywhere. Part of the exhibit includes this sculptural piece containing the items that make a home tossed onto the street. Where so suddenly all of their most precious family objects are sort of ripped out of their home, bound up, and then in the United States, what happens is there's often predatory moving companies that come, take the objects and put them into a storage facility, and then unless the family has enough money, they'll never get their objects back. And so all throughout the nation, there are these warehouses just filled with people's most precious objects. The exhibit relies on educators like Williams and Efren Paderis, who's also homeless, but it also uses numbers. The goal is to illuminate the harsh reality of evictions for low-income renters. In Chicago alone, last year we had, you know, over 24,000 sort of evictions. And so um, we're, we're up there as a city. Research shows that in the U.S., 7.6 million people were threatened with eviction each year between 2007 and 2016. Nearly 3 million of them were children. Some people might think, oh, well, people who are evicted um, don't have jobs. But actually, we have people who are working with us who are hustling, and they actually have three jobs. But because of the housing affordability crisis, he still can't afford to actually live somewhere. Padera says he works, but isn't paid enough to afford rent. Sometimes he stays with friends, but mostly he sleeps outside. First, I was just staying by the train, mostly. Um, not the safest place. I've been robbed twice, um, been assaulted twice. He says he's never been evicted, but knows the pain. I like for people to empathize with people who lost their homes, being evicted and such, because when you lose your home, you lost your private space. You lose your space where you can be safe, where you can be yourself. It's hard to find another place like that. James Lee Williams says it's enough to make him consider his old ways. Years ago, he was sent to prison for bank robbery. But today, he has a good reason to stay hopeful for a better future. My daughter keeps me out of prison because I want her to have the best. You know what I'm saying? My daughter keeps me out of prison. For Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. What a powerful exhibit. But that is Williams and other educators for the exhibit are participants with Redline Service, an organization that provides support for artists who are or have been homeless. The evicted exhibit runs through March 10th at the National Public Housing Museum in River North. Back with more Chicago Tonight Latino Voices in just a moment. But first, a look at the weather. Looking to glide into a new sport, the Chicago Youth Foundation offers a new program to introduce figure skating to diverse neighborhoods across the city. It's called Figure Skating on Your Block, and we spoke with the director to find out more. I just love coaching so much. It was so much fun. I really liked teaching. Not that I knew I would ever like teaching, but it was so much fun, and I loved how fulfilling it was to impart knowledge to other kids and see them grow. In around 2009 or so, Hockey in Your Block started. It was just, you know, an idea I had about how we could maybe make a program for figure skaters that would help um, bring diversity on the ice and help support the kids who are less likely to go into ice sports in general. Because I myself had experience coming from a minority background in figure skating. To even get into the sport, it helps to have access there's a lot of the time a child may not even take, even try a sport out, or parents may not even consider a sport because of the cost, or especially when they see that other kids of their ethnicity or race is not, are not participating in that sport. We're trying to break those barriers down by at the grassroots level, 
by offering free ice skating lessons, not just of people of color, but also people of low socioeconomic status. We have a lot of uh, a great outcome data on kids do really well in school when they play sports. They have a lot more confidence in social interactions when they play sports. They are more likely to just do, do well in all aspects of life when they play sports. It's been two years where we've had the figure skating or block program. We hope that we can get to the point where in the future, they can do ice shows, they can do potentially like synchro competitions. That's, those are some big goals that we hope to reach at some point in the future. Our number one priority is making sure they're safe. And then we also make sure they're having a lot of fun. That looks really cool. I've never done figure skating, but I have done ice skating, if that counts. <laughs> and you can visit our website to learn more about the figure skating on your block program. And that's our show tonight. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com slash news for the very latest from WTTW News. And join us tomorrow night at 5.30 and 7 for the weekend review. Now, from all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Joanna Hernandez. Stay healthy, stay safe. Buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm committed to giving back to the community through law and philanthropy.